I am really pleased to be able to welcome to the stage two really great members of our Detroit community who are doing a lot to get things going. Mike Duggan, who is the mayor, and Peter Scher, who is vice chairman of J.P. Morgan. Welcome, guys. How's everybody today? <laughs> the energetic crowd you got here. I know. Look at this. Nine in the morning. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to start with you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is 10 years since you first ran to be the mayor of the city of Detroit, and you ran at a pretty auspicious time. I mean, we were in the middle still of a bankruptcy, not sure what the future of the city was going to look like. Uh, there were a lot of things in play. Uh, you stepped forward and said, hey, I think I can lead this city to something better. Uh, talk about where you are right now in terms of your priorities, uh, getting the things done that you want to get done uh, in the last few years of this now your third term, uh, but also talk about uh, how far we've come since that, that time in 2013 when all of us were so worried about what was going to happen here. Well, my favorite thing is to talk to people who haven't been here for a few years and see their reaction. Uh, when they come back. we have any folks like that here? Okay. Uh, so pretty, pretty remarkable, isn't it? Uh, so it was, you know, I, I was a kid who grew up in Detroit. When I look at Detroit, I remember Detroit of the 1960s and 70s, which were neighborhoods that were sources of pride, single family home ownership. Uh, uh, you could uh, make a living in the auto industry and and buy a house with a yard and get a cottage. And, uh, it, was a, it was a different time, and that was taken away from us year after year as plants moved out, the lions moved out, the pistons moved out, movie theaters moved out. I mean, you, you live this. And uh, so when I ran in 2013, I still uh, see the city through the eyes of that kid. Uh, who thought Detroit was a magical place and who loved to come down uh, to Hudson's and Sanders and, uh, and the like. And so I had a pretty clear idea. The first four years, uh, half the street lights in the city had been out, the ambulances didn't show up for an hour. First four years were just getting departments to relearn metrics, okay? We are going to plow the snow on a timely basis. Uh, we are going to cut the grass uh, in the parks every 10 days. Uh, and it took a good four years before the services started to get uh, to a level that I felt comfortable with and people really stopped moving out of town. The second four years was, let's lay the groundwork for the jobs of the future. I started off with a 20% unemployment rate, and you got a mix of, of jobs. In cities, you can get the companies that are hiring uh, the kids for the jobs of the future, but I had a lot of Detroiters with high school degrees willing to learn new skills and work hard. They needed to get a good a good living. And so we landed the 5,000 employee G plan, landed several auto suppliers, seating plants and dashboard plants, 400, <coughs> 500 at a time, and then of course got Bill Ford to come in. Now, this, this term, if you were in my cabinet meetings every Wednesday morning, it's all about blight to beauty, that we are going one site after another after another in this city, uh, and we are getting rid of the Packard plant. Uh, we got rid of the AMC headquarters, been abandoned for decades, and now there's a brand new auto plant being built on the site. We knocked down the Cadillac stamping plant that had been abandoned on Connor for decades, and there's now a 500 employee Lear seating plant on the site. And of course, the riverfront, if you haven't been on it, is spectacular. And through the neighborhoods, we're building a 26 mile Joe Lewis Greenway, basically taking abandoned railroad lines uh, and building a walking and biking trail uh, that's raising the property values of a lot of neighborhoods who thought they'd been uh, forgotten. And so now everything is about blight to beauty. And uh, uh, if you saw our charts, it's, uh, it's what are you doing? It's come a long way. Beautiful. Yeah, no question. Um, yeah, go ahead. So talk about your priorities right now, the things that you are still trying to uh, get across the finish line or, or even just get started? Uh, number one priority is we have got to land this University of Michigan Graduate School. Uh, and uh, in the next month, uh, we're going to find out if we can close this. Stephen Ross, uh, who actually is somebody who came back as a result of one of the early homecomings, mm -hmm. uh, and probably the largest developer in the country, 
uh, is, is offered $100 million of his money. The state of Michigan's put up $100 million. But when I went to try to get Bill Ford to put uh, his design center for the electric and automated vehicles of the future in Detroit, he was planning to go to a big field out near the University of Michigan because the talent was coming out of the school. And I pitched him on the fact that you, the talent may be coming out of the school when they graduate. They want to live in the kind of vibrant community we have here in the city, and shouldn't you be basing your long-term strategy on where your talent wants to live? Now, Bill was the one who hit on the idea of the train station. Uh, and, and, of course, it's captured everybody's imagination. He's got first shot at the design talent pool. Um, but I almost lost it because we didn't have what Chicago has, what uh, most major cities has, which is a high-end graduate school with top engineering tech talent coming out of it. Uh, and Stephen Ross comes in and says, this is what we're missing in Detroit. I said, no kidding. Uh, the difference is he had the ability to write a $100 million check. Uh, so I'm hoping the University of Michigan in the next six or eight weeks gives us the go ahead because it will anchor the Grand River Corridor uh, uh, going out to yet yeah, Michigan corridors you've seen is spectacular now. We could see the Grand River Corridor take off over the next 10 years the way the Michigan Corridor has the last time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know you are concerned about uh, property taxes in the city. Everybody is. Uh, I'm a property taxpayer in the city. I can tell you horror stories about uh, the numbers and, and things like that. Um, you have an idea to make that a little better for some of us. Uh, talk about this idea of uh, land value. Well, if you live in Detroit and you own your home, you're paying 67 mills in taxes. If you live in Gross Point, Southfield, Warren, you don't pay 67, you pay about 53 or 54. Uh, and so Detroiters are paying a lot more for the same house before we even start to get into other uh, uh, conditions of living in the areas. And nobody is building single family homes in Detroit because your mortgage is more expensive in Detroit than to build the identical house in Farmington Hills. And so uh, I want to knock that down. And so I propose knocking down the taxes on all improvements, whether it's your house, it's your office building, uh, or the like, 14 mills, competitive with our surrounding communities, and shift those costs by doubling the taxes on the land. Uh, and in this city, we have huge number of abandoned buildings and abandoned property that because <coughs> the value of land in Detroit is so cheap, our tax is close uh, to zero. A, a residential lot in Detroit goes for 500 bucks, in the suburbs it goes for 5,000. What that means is you got a residential lot, you're paying 30 dollars a year in taxes. I've got private owners who own 30,000 abandoned lots in the city, who write their 30 dollar check every year in the hopes of having a lottery ticket that somebody comes along and pays them a ton of money to build a project. I want to shift the taxes from the buildings and the homes to the land. Uh, and all I want is for Lansing to put it on the ballot so the voters can decide. And it's a harder fight than you would think. Uh, but uh, we're grinding away up in Lansing, and uh, uh, we'll see if we get caught up in the partisan politics. Uh, we're going to see there's some Republicans making noise. Do we really want Detroit to be more competitive? Uh, we're going to see how that uh, plays out in the coming weeks working hard at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Peter, uh, I want to talk about J.P. Morgan uh, Chase and the role that it's been playing in Detroit, uh, especially since that time 10 years ago, uh, the, the bankruptcy and the exit from bankruptcy. Uh, you made a real commitment to Detroit, $200 million. Uh, talk about uh, how that's gone, yeah. where that money is. So I'm not a kid who grew up in going, <laughs> going to all the great places in Detroit. Actually, I hadn't been... For 2013, I actually hadn't been to Detroit in 25 years. And uh, back in 2013, you know, J.P. Morgan at that point had been part of this uh, through different iterations, 80 years. And uh, Jamie Dimon had, you know, there's a lot of noise. The city had been in bankruptcy. He had, a, he had a very important conversation with Lee Saunders, who is the, still is the president of AFSCME, the state and county municipal, who was very concerned about how his municipal employees were going to and we're going to fare in the bankruptcy <clears throat> and i'm in new york one day and and sitting in my office and jamie tells me he wants me to come out here and see what we could do to help and i think at the time he was mostly thinking based on his conversation with saunders is there something we could do with you know within the grand bargain and we obviously supported that and contributed to that but <clears throat> you know it was not a pretty picture 
when, when we showed up, as, as the mayor talked about. But the sense you got when I, you know, would meet with Dan Gilbert and meet with, you know, Invest Detroit and meet with Sumozi and, you know, the Kresge and the Detroit, there was a city that had really come together and had some plans and really wanted to re, you know, redirect the future. Um, and we, our, the question we kept asking is, well, how, are there areas that we can uniquely help? And then really once the mayor had, had gotten, had come into office, and this is probably February of 14, Jamie said, okay, now we gotta, it's like we were investing in a company. Now we gotta see, are, you, are we comfortable with the management, <laughs> right? Because for all the plans, for all the money, if you, and so James said, I want you to go out, and he called the mayor and said, you know, I wanna send my guy out there, and uh, I almost missed my flight leaving <laughs> that afternoon, and it really has been, <clears throat> This collaboration, this, I mean, with, with the mayor in terms of, in, in terms of the planning, the direction, J.P. Morgan, you know, we're, here, we're a bunch of guys from Wall Street, we're going to come in and tell, tell you guys how to fix it. What we can do is we can accelerate, we can catalyze, you know, what's going on on the ground, and it has been, it's, it has succeeded beyond, frankly, any expectation. And there were a lot of cynics inside the, and we initially committed 100 million. I can tell you all the finance and risk people gave you, there were a long list of reasons that we shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. And it took a CEO like Jamie to say, look, you know what, if we lose every dollar, JP Morgan will be okay. And we gotta, we gotta try, because Detroit was one of the last cities not to sort of have that comeback. And so we believed in the mayor, we believed in the community, and the numbers bear out, this has been a really great investment for so us from, not from a business standpoint. Yeah. So, so talk about places and things that that we might see or experience that that are a result of of that investment. Well, listen. I think the affordable housing. I mean, the, the mayor has had a, an enormous focus from the beginning around affordable housing, like dealing with the blight. We we invested very early on in the land bank because you took. He came in and was taking institutions in many cases that had been more bond. I mean, or, or just not effective both public and sort of quasi-public, the land bank, Detroit at work. So we invested in the first few years a lot, of, it wasn't sexy work, a lot of it was the systems change. You know, Detroit at work we can talk more about in terms of the, in terms of how do you make sure you're, you have an institution that's, that's uh, recruiting the right talent that companies need. So I think there, listen, Corktown, where we were the other night, you know, I don't think anyone could have imagined what that neighborhood would have looked like. And we now have, not only do we have a community branch there, we're now also sourcing talent for our virtual call center, which I hope we'll get a chance to talk about. So you see it there. Listen, we see it, we look at numbers. We see it in the number of new customers coming in, individual, up significantly. And bank, this is also for a lot of banks, so that's good news. But also you're seeing huge increases, 20, 30% increase in the number of business accounts, but also in the balances are up 40, 50%. So you have more vibrant companies in this, you know, small, medium, large companies in this town, that's gonna drive growth and it's gonna drive jobs and it's gonna drive opportunity and it's gonna drive tax revenue. And that's the, that's I think what they call capitalism. Yeah. And, and it's a demonstration, listen, capitalism hasn't worked. Yeah in a lot of places for a lot of people. And this is a demonstration of when you actually can bring the right people together and put aside all the partisan stupidity, you can actually make a difference for people. Yeah. So, so you're also working pretty directly also with, with businesses here in the city, small businesses, uh, African-American owned businesses. Yes. That's a very important uh, p piece of the picture here uh, in, in Detroit. Uh, how much do you feel like you're moving the needle there? Well, I will tell you a funny story. So this, this, is, this is why this mayor is so unique. So when we, we really approached, this is the first time we'd ever done something like this. <clears throat> and we said, so we're going to approach this like we do business investments. And we had a, we do business reviews for all of our units. And we said, we're going to do a business review every quarter with the mayor. to so go through, and you know, as you know, he's not shy about telling us. And <laughs> one, of the, one of the areas which we actually think we missed early on was, and I miss it, small business. Recognizing how critical small business growth in the city would be to the growth of the economy here. And we made some initial investments in some incubators. 
And I kind of visited, it just didn't feel right. And I'm going through one of these quarterly reviews, and I think it was mid-2015, and the mayor said something like, I said, yeah, I'm not sure these are working. He goes, yeah, they suck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you're missing the point. He said, the problem I've got in the city is we have a lot of black and brown and women and minority entrepreneurs who cannot get access to capital. Right. And so, like, you may have, you may want to, like, fund someone to create the next iPhone or the next iPad, but I've got people, we, we have huge construction projects going on. I want people, entrepreneurs in this city, to be able to be part of that. And so I was like, oh, okay. So Mayor talked about this the other night. So I actually, this is the nice thing about being in a bank. I called the head of our business banking, small business. I said, I need you to lend me a couple, a couple people to think, think this through. We approached the Kellogg Foundation. And we said, let's just try something. Because so, some of the problem is, from a regulatory perspective, if you have people who, you know, they missed a couple payments, they have a slightly worse credit score, we can't lend to them. So we said, let's, okay, let's, what's the workaround? Let's actually create an entity. So we created something called the Entrepreneurs of Color Fund. December 2015, the mayor and I kick it off. It's a snowy night in Detroit. 200 people show up. And I think we had like five, six million dollars in the initial fund. We did 50 loans in the first 16 months, and we had two defaults. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So that's now a 25, yeah, that is, that is a little applaud. So let me add that this is, you're clapping for a banker in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this we'll is get what, to the other part I later. I took my tie off. This is, this is what's so extraordinary. Is I, Jamie has me out to New York, and he does this announcement. We made 50 loans. Uh, uh, and for, 48 of them succeeded, two defaults. He went back to his lenders and said, why? These people had all been excluded from the traditional banking lender market because of their criteria. He says, how do we miss 48 out of 50 black and brown entrepreneurs who are succeeding in our traditional lending practices? There's an inherent bias in here. 100%. He went back and had his lending department Look at their yes. lending practices everywhere. 100%. Uh, as a result of this, so it didn't just fund one fund, but it started to cause, I think, uh, a greater awareness of the opportunity. All right, so we now have small business. As <laughs> you, you said it much more politely than Jamie said it at the time. Okay? <laughs> we now have small business bankers in our in our branch in Corktown because I think the object one of the one of the things I'm most proud of the last ten years we've cut in half the number of people in the city who don't have access to banking and financial service, okay? So you get people into banking channels, you get them support for financial health, you're, ch you're literally changing the trajectory of their families and their lives. And, you know, not to blame this, so the Entrepreneurs Call Fund is now not only, it's now a $25, $30 million fund, we work with Ray Waters and Detroit Development Fund. Mm -hmm. But we've now, what we have learned in Detroit, we've replicated, this is now in 15 cities around the country, and we've actually now, we're trying it overseas. The principles of if you can actually, there's a lot of untapped talent in neighborhoods. If you can get them access to capital and training and jobs, you can explode the economy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I've long thought that, that the, the purpose, the very purpose of government really is to, uh, translate uh, the interest of bankers uh, like J.P. Morgan uh, into uh, the difference in people's lives, right? Uh, that, that we've got investment now in Detroit that we didn't have before. Uh, the question always is, is that making the average Detroiter's life uh, any better? I think the small business uh, work that J.P. Morgan is doing is a really good example of that. But there are lots of other things that Detroiters need as well. Uh, talk about the challenges that remain in terms of making sure that Detroiters benefit from all of this really uh, new investment and excitement about the city. So, I mean, that's the ball game. So the, the, the 10 years before I got elected, 200,000 people moved out of the city of Detroit. Uh, and the people who moved out weren't the low-income homeless folks going to the suburbs. They were the families, working families with children. So when I came in, we had a 20% unemployment rate, a 40% poverty rate, but I wasn't elected by the people who left. I was elected by the people who stayed. And they voted for me because they expected me to create uh, opportunities. And so one of the, uh, uh, Peter talked about Detroit at work. 
where literally we reached out to everybody in the city and said, we, we will get you into a training program that you can make a good living. Uh, and the Cold Shore Art Freeman who built it did a phenomenal job. So Chrysler uh, is selling these Grand Cherokees and, and the, the Jeep plant on the east side of Detroit is uh, at capacity running three shifts. And I go to them as they're starting to look and they said, yeah, we have to build another plant for the demand, another 5,000 jobs. I said, I want to compete. I said, you know, Sergio, you know, was a nice guy and everything, said to me, you don't have any land. I got states with 600 acres of cornfield. That's how you build plants these days. I said, look, does it really hurt you to let me compete? I can close St. Jeans, I can buy this land, I can cobble this together. And he says, fine, go ahead and apply. Uh, so I got in, they cut to five, we were fifth. We're hanging on by our fingernails. I started moving in with them and understanding everything about their business. They cut to three, and we were still hanging in there at three. And what I did was, I looked at their other two sites that they shared with me, which were like 40 miles out of other urban areas in cornfields, and I said, how are you going to fill 5,000 jobs? And I aligned with the HR department. I said, if you'll come to Detroit, we will go and recruit folks for you, provide uh, you with a flow of talent to fill those jobs, and ultimately, they did the unthinkable. They built in the city because they bet on our talent pool. And what we did at Detroit at work is we held uh, uh, sessions all over the city, 200, 300 people at a time in churches. I said, okay, here's the deal. Because I made one deal with, with what was then Fiat Chrysler. I'll give you the 200 acres, no cost. I want one thing in exchange. You interview Detroiters for those jobs before you fill them from any place else. We don't have qualified Detroiters, hire whoever you want. And they said, well, why wouldn't we do that? And so that was the deal. So we held these sessions. We said, you're gonna to have to be on your feet all day. You're gonna to have to pass an eighth grade math and reasoning test. You're gonna pass a drug test. We, we gave them the math and reasoning test. We provided tutoring after hours and on weekends at churches. We gave them 15,000 qualified people the first 5,000 they hired. We're talking $60,000 jobs with benefits you can raise uh, a family on, uh, all 5,000 hired from the city of Detroit. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the kind of living there. I just want to, I, I think it is, it is impossible to overstate the importance of this right now, particularly in a post-COVID world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sit on the J.P. Morgan operating committee every week. We're talking about where are we getting the talent we need. That is the ball game right now. And you're, you're not just competing against Chicago and Columbus and Atlanta. We're competing around the world. This is the ball game. And what Detroit at Work has done, and I'll give you the specific example. The mayor has been on my proverbial butt for years. He kept saying, put a, I want you to put a call center. Mm -hmm in Detroit and Jamie was very supportive and we just we could never make the numbers work it was just to build a brick and mortar call center all that investment and COVID we said oh actually you know people we actually can get some stuff done from home so we finally convinced the the our consumer team that runs the call center let's try let's see if we can do something virtually and they finally agreed we're gonna we will hire 30 people and they said where do you want to do it I said well I don't know let's just how about Detroit just you know <laughs> And so I called the mayor and I said, okay, I got them agree. They're going to hire 30 people. We're going to do this virtual thing. We're going to see if this works. And if after a year, if it doesn't work, call him within two hours. Nicole Sherrod Freeman from Detroit Works on the phone. Within days, we have 50 qualified people. These are at home, full time jobs, full health care benefits. They, the team was so impressed with the quality, they hired all 50. Okay, we're now at 90, okay? They committed to 30, but here's the most important thing. Their performance is outpacing, in June, the customer satisfaction, we basically say, customer, are you satisfied with your experience in this call center, Robert? It is outpacing every brick and mortar call center in the world, and this is saving us money. So. What, what are you paying people to work? We're paying for 25 an hour, full time, full health care benefits. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we, we met with them yesterday. We met. We had a first one year anniversary with with them yesterday. 
Um, and we said, we want this to be your first job in a long career at J.P. Morgan. And listen, not all those jobs, you may have heard Jamie has a view about being at home, not all those jobs are going to be at home, but this is an entry. We're doing financial services, uh, financial health training with them, they're buying cars, they're getting mortgages, and this is now something. So I would say to any of you who are associated with companies, who own companies, who use call center works, there is an ex extraordinary talent sitting in Detroit and if you call Detroit at work, you're going to get the produce quickly. And by the last thing, and I know I'm belaboring this, the other interesting thing about Detroit at work, this loop they've created with businesses, so we, we give them feedback. So we had our first cohort of 50, and they, because Detroit at work actually trains these folks, and they said, okay, here's some of the feedback on the first cohort. By the time we had the second 20, who you met with, we went, met with Cortet, their what we call speed to proficiency, their ability to get up to speed to, in terms of our systems had basically quadrupled. Yeah. So they're getting, to, they're getting up to proficiency in terms of our system, which by the way, saves us money. Mm -hmm. So like this is a win-win for the company. There's just a lot of talent sitting there that companies can tap into. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do want to talk about mortgages uh, in the city of Detroit because uh, that is, of course, a, a huge part of people's uh, lives and their, their financial lives. Uh, I, I went back and looked. In 2013, there were 220 conventional mortgages written in the city of Detroit for homes. 220. Uh, we've come a long way from there. We're at about 2,000 uh, as of uh, 2022 uh, per year. But that, that still represents a real difference with, with other communities. Uh, it is very difficult still for folks to, to get conventional mortgages to buy homes in Detroit. Government, money, how do we, how do we move the needle there? Well, no question. My first quarter in, in the office, I, we looked at the numbers, and I think that quarter there were like 42 mortgages issued in the city. And we went around the room, and we knew among our cabinet, 20 of the people who had gotten the mortgage. Or something. Uh, we, and they were like in four neighborhoods. They were in, in Palmer Woods, in Indian Village, in Sherwood Forest, and it was ridiculous. Everything else was cash sales. And it was overwhelmingly landlords buying it, which meant your, your home ownership number was going down. Mm -hmm. We've done a number of things. The Detroit home mortgage uh, that the banks came together on helped change those numbers. The Obama administration sent their treasury officials in here. I sat with President Obama and I said, I want to show you what's going on with your regulation, which was in response to the, the financial meltdown. I said, I've got a guy who put an offer in on a house in Green Acres 2,500 square foot house, buy it for $60,000, and he was turned down because of the appraisal. He went across the street to Ferndale, and the same guy got approved for a $150,000 house that's half the size and half the quality. Mm -hmm. You guys are killing us. The president was furious. The treasury <laughs> officials were in the next week, and there was an appraisal issue that, that the state, the federal regulators were actually uh, restricting the banks. These guys will talk at length about it, but now, we have had one program after another that's gotten us from 200 to, to 2,000. But now the most exciting thing we've got is this down payment assistance program mm -hmm. that the banks have partnered with us on. And, and we put uh, now $20,000 if you have lived in Detroit for a year, haven't owned a house, uh, you're, you're purely a renter, uh, and you want to buy. So basically you're paying 1000 bucks a month in, uh, in your rent today. You could pay your... your a note in your, your taxes and have money left over except you don't have the down payment. We have now, in 90 days, had 200 people mm. who have closed across all the banks uh, and they showed me the numbers and the most interesting statistic of all, 91% of these homeowners are African American. Yeah. Uh, mm. We are finally figuring out how to drive black homeowners. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen. There are there are so many. We were actually took one of the one of the call center employees, Jamie, who who just bought a more. Anyone bought a house, and you know, you got twenty six pages of documents to know. That you, you talk about the systemic hurdles to getting people. And yes, we've done better. I mean, I was just going over the numbers this morning. So yeah, we have a two hundred percent increase. It's okay, yeah, but that's two hundred percent increase <laughs> is not like let's really deal with the problem. So look, you got challenges. Interest rate, you know, in, interest rates are not seven percent, three and a half percent. So I think it's ensuring we've got the affordable homes. We're, we now, it's, the, it's the programs that the mayor talked about. We now provide $5,000 grants for, for home buyers because we want to get people um, into homes. We also have to look at how do we change how we're judging credit. If someone's been paying rent for 20 years and reliably they have a job, they've been paying it, 
that doesn't count to your credit score. Right. We have to change that. And so one of the things we look at in Washington is how do we change the policies that restrict our ability to look at someone who clearly, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's an entrepreneur's a color fund loan or a mortgage, this is a reliable, you know, credit worthy person. How do we judge them in a way that's going to get them the loan? There's obviously a lot more work to do, but I think we can good, feel good about the progress, but there's a lot more we have to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, you're here in front of uh, a group of people who are interested in Detroit, many of them from here, uh, visiting from other places. Uh, what do you need from these folks uh, as you continue to work on these problems? Yeah, you know, I, I just want you to come in and, uh, and take a look, and uh, if there's something in your life uh, that uh, you can benefit from from being back in Detroit, whether it's an investment, whether it's a business, whether it's fixing up a house for uh, a relative, uh, or whether it's coming back home. Uh, it's, it's a really exciting time uh, to be here. And, uh, you know, I, I, if you're from here, you know this, and, and we say this all the time, uh, that Detroit is, is big enough to matter in the world and is small enough for you to matter. And the people who are transforming it, I mean, you probably don't want to talk about this, what Stephen Henderson did with a vacant house that had been his family's house <laughs> over in a neighborhood that you took on, what, seven, eight years ago? Yep. Uh, and I don't want to say this too harshly, but you would not have been crazy about driving down that block at night uh, <laughs> seven or eight years ago. In fact, when I came to you and asked if you could help me uh, from the city side, uh, you told me no. You said it wasn't, it wasn't a neighborhood that had a future. <laughs> Tell them what it's like today. Uh, so we did buy the house that I uh, lived in when I was uh, born here in Detroit. It was vacant. There were 23 vacant houses on the block uh, when we bought it. Uh, we made it into a literary arts center and a community center. But at the same time, uh, the mayor courted the, uh, the Union of Carpenters and Millwrights here in the state to build their uh, training center, their regional training center at the end of our block. They spent $30 million in our neighborhood, in a neighborhood that uh, has seen almost no investment since I was born. Um, it is a different place uh, today. Uh, it turns out someone spends $30 million in your neighborhood, all kinds of things are possible. <laughs> uh, and so we are, uh, we've kind of transitioned from the idea of asking, begging people uh, to do things in the neighborhood to trying to figure out how to manage all the interest and, and make sure, of course, that our neighbors, the folks who live there, uh, are part of what's changing or part of uh, the progress, but uh, it, it is something that I would never have imagined when I drove past that house and it was abandoned and I bought it for $500 out of the land bank um, that, that we would be at this point. So if you got something inside you, it's really rewarding. The Stephen's story is great. It is a story that is repeated in neighborhood after uh, neighborhood. I, I look at um, uh, the Bartels and the comeback uh, former NFL player opens up uh, Cuzzo's, a fried chicken and waffle store on Livernoy when there's not a lot going on. Uh, and if you haven't had it, fried chicken and waffles are a lot better than it sounds. Uh, and so <laughs> he opens up on Livernoy, and it is so good, it's jammed. And we have parking meters that have hour limits on them. Uh, the line was an hour long, and he came to complain to me because all of his customers are getting parking tickets uh, <laughs> waiting to get in. We literally tore out the parking meters and put in four-hour meters because of the impact of one guy. You go, if you haven't done it, drive down Livernoy right now between 7 and 8 Mile. It is one of the most vibrant commercial districts anywhere in the state of Michigan, and we did a lot of things to support him. But it came with one person mm -hmm. making a difference, uh, and now uh, it's it spread. And, and we're seeing that while blight spreads, we're finding the progress spreads too, and you've seen that in your neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, Peter, uh, what's next for J.P. Morgan here in, in Detroit? Listen, I think I have some of the, the business leaders here, Jason and Tara, and their boss, Tony, for, has come in from Chicago. Look, I think we want to we continue to grow our business here. I mean, the, when you've got more vibrant businesses, we, that's our job. We support them, we help them grow, we invest in them. They, have, they hire more people, we support them. Uh, I think the fact that I would not have imagined 10 years ago that we would be, we would be sourcing 
call center talent out of Detroit. So I think we want to continue uh, to grow that. And listen, what we wanted, what we said from the beginning, this was not, we were not, do, we're, we are a bank. Mm -hmm. This was not about charity. We wanted to make an investment that would create a sustainable economy, and that's that's and what we're seeing. you think that the business case for Detroit uh, right oh, now there's, is? There's, I, got, I got three. These guys have to do business reviews with Jamie Dimon, which, you know, I actually think business reviews with him are a little tougher, to be honest with you. <laughs> but no, listen, at the end of the day, I can, I can sort of harp on our guys and say, you know, I really want you to think about putting calls in. I can't force those decisions. I couldn't make the economics of a traditional brick and mortar call center work, but the, the business case around hiring virtual call centers, and then to me now, I want to get other companies, because I really think if we can create an ecosystem in, front of the, in the, some of these neighborhoods where we're taking our 90 or 100, and you have hundreds of call center jobs, whether they're virtual or live, and you've got Detroit, you're just, you're increasing the pool for everyone. So I just think the opportunity we see here to keep growing our business is enormous. Yeah, yeah. How much more uh, do you need from banks, uh, Mr. Mayor, in the, in the last few years? of Well, the well a, a lot. And uh, you, you see what's happening right now. Of course, we were on uh, an office boom construction. That's stopped everywhere in the country. We are certainly far better off than Chicago or New York. We had such a huge amount of office space in the first place. In Detroit, we were already converting over. The, the David Whitney building converted from office to housing. The David Stott building, uh, Dan Gilbert just finished the, the book building. So Detroit was doing that as we are building a, a real uh, downtown neighborhood. And this city is becoming a night. If you were here in Detroit, you know uh, that at 5.30 at night, this place was empty. You drove in at 8.30 in the morning, you left at 5.30 night, and there was nothing <laughs> on the streets afterwards. Uh, now. It is booming uh, nights and weekends uh, on the streets of this city. And, uh, and I'm really excited about the riverfront. The people who ran the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, what they have done uh, has been remarkable. But you just look at this year, uh, they now have a walkway along the riverfront that you can walk from the Ambassador Bridge to the Belle Isle Bridge uh, along the river. Uh, we just opened up. Uh, Roosevelt Park in front of the train station, if you haven't seen that park, it's now become one of the, the hottest parks in town, wasn't there for all practical purposes a year ago. And next year, the Ralph Wilson Foundation is going to open the Ralph Wilson Park on the river, which is basically right below the post office. <laughs> it is going to be the most spectacular park uh, in the city. And I am very focused around the fact that if you haven't been to an NFL draft, it's an experience. Four or 500,000 people <laughs> show up from around the country convinced that their team's going to make a first-round draft choice. It's going to change the trajectory of the franchise. Uh, those folks are all coming here. And I don't, you know, you can say whatever you want about national media. They're going to write what they're going to write. <laughs> Nothing changes your opinion like visiting. And I am so obsessed with the experience that if you notice you drove in, the grass on the freeways was cut, the garbage was picked up. I got fed up with the fact that the state only cut the freeways twice a year and cleaned up the garbage once a quarter. <laughs> so this year, we took it over from the state. <laughs> they said, here, you have it. <laughs> but nobody driving in came out 94 and saw the trash in the overgrown grass and said, man, MDOT's doing a lousy job. They came in and said, ah, the city of Detroit doesn't care, right? And so you drive out, I want you to look. You will not see any graffiti in this city. You will not see, right? <laughs> you will not see an abandoned building from the freeway, an abandoned house. We've gone through, taken out those sight lines. You will not see a tent city in the city of Detroit. Um, and, and so these are things, what we have done on affordable housing and homelessness dwarfs what's been done in every other city in the country. And, and when other mayors come in, they're like, where's your tent city? I said, what's a tent city? Uh, we, don't, we don't do that uh, around here. Uh, so. We are, every single day now, I got somebody who's going down, Grash and Woodward. If there's rusted out fences, we're ticketing the company and we're hauling the rusted out fences away. If there's a busted out awning or sign on an abandoned building, we're hauling it away. We are going one lot at a time right through the city, removing that ugliness, uh, and uh, bring, bring folks back next April with you for the NFL draft. This city's going to look spectacular. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Peter Scher, Mayor Duggan.
great to have you both up here. Thanks, Thanks. Steven. Good to see you. Thank you all.